And then I'd say, uh, Katarina, you can uh, go ahead. Thanks for being here with us today. Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the invitation. And thank you for the very um, kind introduction uh, and very elaborate uh, introduction. Uh, very cool thing. So um, today I thought I would start by um, the presentation by giving a bit of a background to uh, place my research into a broader context. And then I will go into a bit of more detail and present two complementary research projects on how rhythmic auditory stimulation can help to guide our perceptual processing. And first, um, a one study of my PhD where um, uh, I investigated within sensory modalities and then one recent study where um, I investigated the synchronization of nerve oscillations across sensory modalities. And I will end the presentation today by giving an outlook on what I'm currently working on. So already 80 years ago, it has been proposed that brain oscillations reflect rhythmic fluctuations of neuronal ensembles between high and low excitability states. So in this red trace here, you see the firing rates of a group of neurons. And closely, these firing rates are not random, but they are actually clustered at certain times. So when they're clustered, there's an increased firing that is what we would refer to as a high excitability state, opposed to times where there are little to none firings. Um, so since this initial propositions, many studies have confirmed and actually support the idea that neural oscillations are really instrumental to brain operations. So we do not only have rhythms in the brain, but also there are many um, rhythms in our environment and actually many natural stimuli are characterized by some degree of temporal regularity. So one very prominent example that's very often used is music where we have a very strong rhythm and a strong beat. Um, and, but also if we go outside and look around the nature, if we hear bird chirping or if we are at the beach, uh, the waves of the ocean, um, have a rhythmic structure, or if we chat to our friends, speech is also another example. Our brain is quite remarkable and can actually capitalize on these environmental rhythms. And it has been suggested that the synchronization between these external environmental rhythms and our internal rhythms facilitates our sensory processing. So this synchronization between external and internal rhythms is... Uh, of Katarina, sorry, yes? can I just quickly interrupt you? Because I think there is something stuck on your slide in the top right corner. I don't know if it is also the case. Oh, now it's gone. I don't know what you did, but... <laughs> Okay, so yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I didn't I didn't do anything actually, but <laughs> let me know if it's continuing. Okay, and it, it looks perfectly fine now. Sorry for interrupting you. Uh, no problems. It's better uh, that like we just uh, discussed before. So um, to continue, the synchronization between external and internal rhythms is also referred to as entrainment. And I will start now by having a closer look at the basic concept of neural entrainment. So while you're sitting here in front of your screen and um, listening to my talk, there is a lot of spontaneous oscillation going on in your brain. If I would play you now a series of temporal regular events, like a series of click tones, these ongoing oscillations gradually synchronize to this rhythmic input stream. So these ongoing oscillations align to this external rhythm by adjusting the phase to, make, to match exactly the frequency of the external stimulation. And this is what we would refer to here as entrained oscillation. So really the synchronization of neural oscillation to an external rhythm by a phase adjustment is what I define as entrainment. So there has been a vast increase in studying neural entrainment over the past day starting with the groundbreaking work by Charles Schroeder and Kita Lakatosh. Um, these neural entrainment effects have been observed in response to the auditory stimulation of a very impressive body of work by Molly Henry, for example, and also Sylvie Nozaradan. But also in the visual modalities, one example is Cal Matthewson's paper for um, rhythmic stimulation in the algorithm. 
This neural entrainment has often been linked to perceptual benefits, such as faster reaction times and also higher accuracies for targets that are presented in phase with an external rhythm. And the effects often been observed also in the low frequency delta and beta ranges. It's mostly true for the auditory modalities. So if we have, again, a closer look at this figure, one very prominent feature of auditory stimuli is that they are naturally unfolding over time. And our brain needs to continuously track this incoming auditory information to keep the internal representations up to date. If we now look at this entrainment framework, these ongoing oscillations synchronized to the external rhythm, this is, which is also a process that happens over time. So while these temporal dynamics are quite critical to entrainment, at the time I did my PhD, there was actually very little research investigating this temporal evolution over the time course of several seconds. So that leads me to um, the main research question from the first project I will present today, which is how does entrainment actually evolve over time? So in this first study, we compared long and short periods of stimulation to investigate the temporal dynamics of neural entrainment. So in particular, we used a three hertz frequency modulated tone in which we embedded 12 short silent gaps that were equally distributed around the unit circle. So the gaps are very short. They were between 10 to 20 milliseconds in length and they were individually adjusted for each participant. So on the left hand side here, you see this gap location plotted onto the sine wave. And on the right hand side, I plotted them onto the unit circle. So the exact same location, just two different visualizations. So in the <clears throat> Sorry. In the long condition, we inserted the gaps after five seconds of stimulation. And in the short condition, they already occurred after one second. And we um, distributed them across three cycles just to reduce the predictability within the auditory stream. So the periodicity was conveyed via fluctuations in frequency. And the advantage of using such a continuous frequency modulated sound is that this type of auditory stimulation conveys clearness in the perception of the listener, doesn't have any clear perceptual onset, for example, at discrete tones. So what was the task of the participants? So um, the participants were instructed to listen to the tones and to press a button as soon as possible when they're detected the gap within the stream. So to give you an impression of how these tones sounds like, um, I hope they're not too loud coming out here. And um, I will play first the short sound um, and then the longer sound. And maybe if you would like, you can just um, indicate with a small uh, emoji or raising your hand whether you heard the gap or not. So this was the first sound. Um, I know it very much sounds like a police siren. Um, and here comes the longer version. So, okay, I saw at least one person raising your hand. Um, very good um, to detect the gap in there. So um, here are some others too, thanks. Um, so if you haven't heard the gap, um, it might be that you were just not really entrained to the tone, or it could be that the task is really hard. So in this example that I played you, the gap was actually 50 milliseconds long. And I told you that they're actually between 10 to 20 milliseconds. And so usually the, our participants didn't really hear the gap. They just heard like a faint squibble in the sound to which they really reacted to. So it was um, really a threshold task. Um, okay, so what were our predictions for uh, the study? We uh, predicted that this long stimulation would lead to um, higher accuracies for this longer compared to the short condition on the behavioral level. And on the neural level, we hypothesized that this long stimulation would lead to an increase in the synchronization strength. So the coupling between the auditory stimulation 
and the brain. So we'll start now with looking at the behavioral group average data. I calculated two behavioral measures. Uh, once they're curious yeast, uh, where I just averaged the hit rates across all the gap locations for each subject and condition, and the modulation index, index which was calculated by subtracting the gap location with the worst performance by the gap location with the best performance. So in contrast to our prediction, um, neither the accuracy nor the modulation index showed an increase for this long stimulation. So does this mean that the simulation had no effect on our behavioral performance at all? So far, we only looked at the group average data. However, we can also look at the individual subject level. Um, one way to show that neural oscillation are crucial for behavior is that um, also the behavior oscillates. And by inserting gaps at distinct time points with, within the stimulus, we were able to investigate such oscillatory behavior. So on the left-hand side, you see um, the first gap location on the unit circle. And on the right-hand side, the black line is a schematic of our sound. The red dot is the first gap location. And so for each of these locations, we calculated the accuracies and we did this separately for each participant. So we did this for the first, the second, and the third, and eventually for all our 12 locations. And then this behavioral profile emerges for um, the long condition in green and the short condition in blue. And we concatenate the two cycles for better visualization purposes. So here you see the data of four exemplary participants. It is quite obvious, I think, from eyeballing that the behavior performance is quite closely following out of auditory stimulation. But what we also see is that across participants, there are quite some individual differences um, with some participants having a smaller lag, whereas other participants are almost in antiphase, um, antiphasic relationship. So I was then interested whether um, the stimulation the behavioral are actually correlated with each other. And so we calculated circular linear correlations um, across participants, and we found that there is a significant stimulus behavior correlations for both the short and long conditions. So how can we go now from this um, individual profiles to um, group um, average level? So when we look at the behavioral oscillation, we most of the time see a very clear peak for each participant. We then can fit a single cycle sine wave to the data, and we can determine the phase angle. So here on the sine wave for the best performance for each participant. And we can plot this onto the unit circle. So our example here with the thread arrow is this participant down here. So these plots here show the distribution of phase angles for the best performance, and each of these dots represents a single subject. So there is quite a spread um, of the participants, but most of them are actually clustered around here. And if we compare the two conditions in short and long, we see that there might be like a descriptive shift in the phase um, between these two. So from the behavioral data, we were also interested in neural entrainment um, and we recorded 64 channel EEG. And in order to get a better estimation of the auditory cortex activation, we source localized the EEG data. And if you're interested um, in the pipeline, how we used it, we also published it later on in this paper here. So when talking about neural entrainment, one prerequisite is that you see the frequency of interest in your frequency spectra. So basically the stimulation frequency. Um, I did first determine a region of interest here in the auditory cortex and then calculated the frequency spectrum, which shows a clear peak at our stimulation frequency, three hertz, and also at the six hertz harmonic. And the subsequent calculations that you will see were all done on this um, region of interest here. So I told you that I was interested in temporal dynamics of neural entrainment. And in order to investigate the prediction that long stimulation leads to an increase of phase coupling strength, I computed the normalized Shannon entropy. So normalized Shannon entropy is um, phase coupling measure 
and the value of one would indicate a perfect coupling between um, the stimulation and the brain, and the value of zero would actually indicate that there is no coupling at all. So this temporal evolution was characterized by a very fast buildup in stimulus brain coupling over this first two seconds of stimulation. However, if we compare these two great shaded areas for the early gap in the world and for this uh, long gap in the world, we actually did not see a further increase over time. So we were not only inter interested in this coupling strength, but also in the phase relationship between the stimulation in the brain. And we extracted the phase angles for these gray shaded areas um, for both the short and long condition which you can see in the right hand side. So each dot again presents uh, one single participant. And if we test the two against each other, we see that there is actually a um, significant shift, phase shift from the um, short to the long condition. And this shift is also correlated with uh, descriptive shift we have seen in uh, behavior later. So to sum up this first part of the talk, um, on a behavioral level, we have seen that our auditory performance was modulated by the phase of the three hertz frequency modulated tone. Um, and we've seen this individual stimulus behavior profiles. So this is basically a replication um, and it's an extension of the early study by Molly Henry and Jonas Oblazer that were published in 2012. If we look at the temporal dynamics, um, neural entrainment is really a fast process. And um, within one to two seconds, also participants are actually really entrained and on top of the stimulation. And while there was no increase in this phase clapping over time, we actually see a significant phase shift uh, when we compare the short and the long condition. So taken together, we conclude that, that neural oscillations in the auditory cortex dynamically track the rhythmic environment to stimuli over time. So very often, we are not faced with only one single um, stimulus. In our daily life, we actually continuously receive multiple inputs from different sensory modalities, such as sight, sound, or touch. Um, while I'm talking to you, if you're looking at the screen, you actually see me talking, um, and you also have your auditory input. Um, <clears throat> two weeks ago, uh, Julian Kahn, who I think is, yeah, is also here today, um, also talked um, about this um, multisensory environments and how uh, and multisensory integrations um, in his talk. So here in my example, I want you to imagine to standing on a train platform, maybe not the best place to be right now with COVID, but just imagine that we can travel on holidays or to a conference again. So while you're looking at your phone or chatting to a friend, you all of a sudden hear the rattling noise of the incoming train and you turn your head and search for the source of the sound. So in this scenario, an auditory input can help us to guide our visual perception and increase the salience of certain elements in a visual scene. So in our case, the incoming train. And it has been suggested that inputs from one sensory modality can be informative and actually influence both the neural and behavior processing in other sensory modalities. And we can probe this cross-modal influences also via entrainment. So if we go back to this uh, framework here um, that I presented earlier, one of the building blocks as proposed by um, Peter Lakatosh is that neural entrainment is supermodal meaning that neural oscillations in one modality can be entrained by rhythmic inputs of any other sensory modality. In this example here, an auditory rhythm cannot only modulate um, activity in the auditory cortex, but also visual cortical activity via the synchronization of neural oscillations. So where we in the beginning, um, they're not synchronized over time, this auditory rhythm actually synchronizes both activity in auditory and visual cortices. And this leads me to a second research question, a second project I want to present today, that is, can auditory rhythms not only guide our auditory perception, which we've just seen, but also our visual 
perception. So how did our paradigm look like? In our case, we presented as, again, a three hertz frequency modulated tone to our participants. So to reiterate the advantage of using such a continuous frequency modulated sound is that this type of auditory stimulation conveys a clear rhythmicity in the perception of the listener while keeping the overall energy or the amplitude of the sound constant over time. So along this auditory stimulation, we very briefly presented like a bore patch that was either oriented to the right or to the left. So the four patches were presented at new thresholds and were individualized again for each participant and they were also immediately masked after presentation. So the task of the participant was to um, listen attentively to the tones, they could hardly ignore them, um, and then press the button as fast as possible to indicate the orientation of the Gabor, so whether it was right or left oriented, while we recorded 60 to 10 EG. So I will not play the sound for you again, but it's exactly the same sound that you've heard before, just two seconds in length and some time on, uh, on the screen, you had a flash of this Gabor patch presented to you. So critically, we manipulated where Gabor occurred along the auditory stimulation. So we placed them at 20 distinct face angles with respect to the three hertz frequency modulated tone. So on the left-hand side, you see them plotted again on the sine wave. On the right-hand side, they're plotted on the unit circle. And we presented the visual targets after one second of auditory stimulation. So what I've learned from my previous study is that it takes about one second for the participants to be entrained. So you have this one second of auditory stimulation, and then we distributed the visual targets across the second um, part again, to reduce the predictability. Okay, so before I go and talk about the uh, results, I would like to briefly explain the behavioral measures that we use. So we applied signal detection theory to calculate the visual target sensitivity, which was based on the button presses in the response to the Gabor orientation. So whether they're uh, pressed right or left oriented. And very similar, or actually, exactly the same as before, we calculated the sensitivity for each visual target time and separately for each participant. So here you see again um, the sine wave and the first visual target time on the right hand side. This is um, schematic of the sound. Again, the first visual target time. So we did this for the first, second, eventually for all 20 target locations. And we concatenated two cycles again for better visualization purposes. From here, we calculated the circular linear correlation, so the correlation between the sound and our behavioral profile. And then we fitted again a single cycle sine wave, so this dashed um, line here, to determine the phase angle for the best performance. So here's the peak, and we determined the phase angle here which we can then again map onto the unit circle. Okay, so here you see data from six uh, exemplary participants. I will show you the data from all 28 subjects in a second, but that's quite overwhelming. So uh, let's um, start with this six here. Um, similar to before, one way to show that neural oscillations are involved in perceptual processing is to show that behavior performance oscillates. And in this, uh, six participants, again, quite obvious, I think, by eyeballing that the performance is very closely following the auditory stimulation. So with the one difference than before, that before it was actually auditory performance, but here it's the visual target performance. Um, despite the fact that we didn't have any rhythmic visual input um, in the, our data, we see this cyclic modulation of um, visual performance. And what you can also see again is that there is quite some uh, variation in terms of the lag across the participants. So here you see the data of all 28 participants and I will walk you through this plot. So the value here in the right corner depicts the circular linear correlation value for each participant and their order from high to low behavioral entrainment. 
um, the colored um, lines correspond to the participants that you've seen on the previous slides. So overall participants, we found that visual target sensitivity was modulated by the 3, three hertz frequency modulated tone. If you look at an individual level out of these 28 participants, only seven did not show a circular linear correlation. So these are the seven gray um, participants down here. Further, we used k-means clustering to divide our data into three groups, which will become more important later on um, in the neural behavior relationship. So we had these three groups, which are called high entrainment, we have the medium entrainment, and the low entrainment group. I also plotted the, <clears throat> excuse me, the phase angle distributions um, for the best performance. So the dots here, color dots, correspond to these participants on the left hand side. And we do see, if we do a rate test, actual significant clustering, but you can also see that there again is quite some variation um, across the participants. So let's look at the neural data as the main indicator for neural entrainment, we calculated the intertrial phase coherence. So intertrial phase coherence assesses the consistency of brain responses across trials in response to the auditory simulation. So on the right hand side, we see um, the three hertz topography for this um, time window of interest. So we chose half a second before the visual targets appeared. So here in our time window of interest, we only had auditory simulation and no visual targets who were presented here in the second um, part of the simulation. If you think, okay, this doesn't look like my typical auditory um, topography where you usually have this very central block, that's true. We use the Laplacian surface filter, which is basically increases spatial resolution and obtains a reference-free representation of the underlying currents. And as my um, supervisor here, Kino said, this topography also very much looks like a duck and a rabbit who are fighting over food. So, <clears throat> with, so we saw this really increase in uh, intertrial phase coherence across all channels, but what we're really interested in is to see whether there's specific activations for auditory and visual regions. And so we um, chose these four electrodes on each side and plotted the intertrial phase coherence and we see this huge increase um, in intertrial phase coherence here on the middle, it's actually collapsed over time. And when we compare it to the baseline, we see a significant increase. Um, so the really interesting question is what happens in the visual areas now? So we chose the three channels here in the back. And also here, we see an increase in intertrial phase coherence, which is a bit smaller. Um, compared to the auditory stimulation, it's also what you would expect. Um, but if we compare it to a baseline period, so we see also an increase in these visual channels, despite the fact that there was no visual rhythmic stimulation. Then the next question that we were asking is, is there any relationship between this increase in phase coherence and our behavioral performance? So we used a K-means algorithm on our behavioral data, which partitioned our individuals uh, into a high entrainment, a medium, and a low for small behavior entrainment group. So the sorting was exclusively done in the pattern of the behavioral data. And if we look at the neural data, what we see is that in the group that also has a high cross-small entrainment, we see a huge increase in the uh, intertrial phase coherence and its visual electrodes, where there's virtually no activity for the seven people who did not show a, a significant um, cross-modal behavioral entrainment. So if we test it um, statistically, we saw that there was a significant linear trend among the means of the three groups, um, which was only evident uh, for visual electrodes, but not if we do the same for auditory electrodes. So to sum up this um, second part, we saw that visual target performance was modulated by the phase of the three hertz frequency modulated tone. We also saw that this rhythmic modulation of neural activity could be seen across auditory, but more importantly also across visual electrodes, and that 
this cross-modal auditory to visual entrainment was related to the degree to which visual perception fluctuates. So altogether, we concluded that this auditory scripting stimulation can actually not, guide, or not only guide our auditory perception, but also here it works across the senses and influences our visual perception. So um, these were the two main studies that I wanted to present, and I would like to give now um, an outlook on what I'm currently working on in a collaboration uh, with my friend and um, her Anna Sam, who is working at Aarhus University. So far, I have talked about synchronization of neural oscillations at um, individual level, level. So very basic research, what happens if we are listening to an auditory stimulus within and across sensory modalities. However, synchrony is also highly important in many aspects of our life and has a very strong social component that I'm basically lacking so far um, in this research. So if you look at a few examples, music making might be an obvious one that um, doesn't matter if you're having like duets, like two pianists working together or an orchestra, um, the musicians have to coordinate the actions. They're actively synchronizing to um, produce a good performance. Also, if we go to sports, rowing is a very synchronized activity. And if you're in either Oxford or Cambridge, the pro trace that happens in March and is very, very important. Um, and so that maybe the team that better synchronizes usually wins, but that's um, up to the, the question. But um, another example is um, dance or any rhythmic activity um, to require synchronization. So really interpersonal synchrony between people often features the coordination of our rhythmic actions. So we have this behavioral synchronization. And what Anna and what we have shown is that on a neural level, this neural oscillation very closely tracked the temporal dynamics of this behavioral synchrony between the two people. And so as our um, lockdown project, basically we were, um, sitting together and thinking, okay, this frequency model that, that tone has quite some advantages. Um, can we use this to actually study um, joint action? And yes, we came up with a novel paradigm to investigate um, joint action in a continuous fashion. So the task of the participants is to move their finger in a continuous motion around the ring sensor. So they have basically a small sensor in front of them, ring sensor, and they get a cue at a certain speed. So get a metronym cue, and then they have to move their finger at this certain speed. And while they're moving their finger, they're actually producing a frequency modulated sound. They're not doing this alone. They are doing this in pairs. Um, and so the idea is that while they're synchronizing their behavior and producing this frequency modulated tones, um, also their um, cortical oscillation actually synchronize. So we had a couple of auditory feedback manipulations. I have one condition, which basically are baseline conditions where they only hurt themselves and not each other. So they solely relied on this um, pacing cue in the beginning to just keep the speed. And then we had two unidirectional um, conditions where they could hear the partner and then um, the other way around. And then we had a bidirectional coupling condition where they basically hurt the partner's um, movement or producing the tones. So we did um, a validation study with now 15 pairs and we first calculated the relative phase um, on our behavioral data. Um, and so the length of these errors here that you see here actually shows how strongly the partners synchronize the actions with each other. And also as we would have expected, the lowest synchrony is actually in the uncoupled condition where they cannot hear each other. And then we see the strongest synchronization in the condition where they can actually hear each other. So another measure, um, that we used for this um, behavioral data was to calculate the cross correlation, which basically quantifies the lag in behavioral synchrony between the partners. 
So if we look um, at a condition where they actually can hear each other, there's basically a zero lag. Um, however, in this unidirectional conditions, um, a leader follow pattern emergence where one partner that hears the other actually anticipates the movement of the other partner. So this is our validation study and COVID permitting, we're now starting um, data collection onto the neural data, and, but uh, we think that these behavioral data already look quite promising to work with. So with this, I just want to give you a few take home messages um, for today. So this auditory frequency model as it sounds what we've seen in um, the studies that I've presented is that it can act as a pacing signal for neural oscillations both unimodal but also in cross-modal contexts. Um, the tones are a very strong driving force they're very hard to ignore and they can basically guide our behavioral performance within but also across sensor modalities and um, we think that we can also use it to probe um, interpersonal synchrony between two partners. And with this, I would like to send my um, lab here. So that's the, I think two years ago now, the last group picture that we have, um, my um, supervisor Kianovra, but also my PhD supervisor, Stefan Debener and Anna, um, some my um, long-term collaborator. And thank you for, for listening to the talk. <laughs>